In the mid-22nd century, the Alpha Quadrant was a far more unstable and volatile region than today, with local species all vying for power and territory. It was a region in disarray. Of these species, the most powerful were the cold and aloof Vulcans. However, even they, at the height of their power, struggled to preserve peace. The other races regarding them as emotionless and untrustworthy elitists, who looked down upon the other races. And so, as the different species fought one another, Vulcans against Andorians, Andorians against Tellarites, Vulcans against Klingons, envious eyes watched from the shadows and saw it ripe for the taking. It was not until 2254 that the intentions of this hidden power were discovered by the human caption Archer. The species of this region soon realized that they must stand together or fall alone. But were they too late to stop the Alpha Quadrant from falling under the shadow of the raptor's wings? The Alpha Quadrant of the mid-22nd century presented a very different picture to today, being more fragmented and lacking the unity which it now enjoys. At the time, the dominant race in the region were the Vulcans, who, with their advanced technology, boasted a large and impressive defense fleet, larger than any of their immediate neighbors. However, this combined with a tendency to look inward and an isolationist foreign policy caused many of their neighbours to regard the Vulcans with suspicion. This issue was further exacerbated as the Vulcans suffered further diplomatic humiliation as their spy station at the Pajem Monastery was discovered and border disputes began to break out with the Andorians. It appeared that the Vulcans were losing their grip on the region. Tensions would continue to escalate between the Vulcans and Andorians, eventually coming to a head at the Battle of Andoria. Before the Andorians were overwhelmed, the Vulcan fleet was recalled after a coup saw Minister Vlas replaced by Tapau. Had this not been the case, it is likely that the Andorians would have been overwhelmed. For those who had a vested interest in destabilizing the region, this proved to be something of a setback. As a result, those parties sought to induce instability by more direct means. This took the form of false flag operations carried out by vessels equipped with holographic camouflage operated by means of telepresence with the goal of being completely untraceable. However, rather than causing conflict, the mission had the opposite effect. The species of the region began to work together to counter these attacks. The officer responsible for this failed operation was disgraced and court-martialed. Newer, more aggressive measures were called for if this new alliance was to be extinguished in its infancy. However, they would need to move cautiously as their involvement was suspected. After this, the coalition was formalized upon the signing of a new treaty. It was realized that war with this new coalition was likely. As such, it was necessary to do as much as possible to weaken the coalition's hand. This began with a brutal attack on Caridian Prime, crashing a hijacked ship into the surface, killing half a billion inhabitants and destroying much of their dilithium reserve. A few months later, they put their latest weapon to the test. They used their new telecapture device to hijack Klingon warships and force them to attack coalition ships in the hope of causing a war between the two. However, the shadowed veil finally slipped, revealing the identity of the unknown aggressors when the Enterprise rescued the survivors of a brutal raid on Tarod 9. They were able to describe the attackers, a description which matched ships Enterprise had encountered 
two years earlier, Romulan ships. And on May 18th, 2156, the Romulans revealed themselves, destroying the USS Patton after it apparently fired on a Romulan colony. They sent a declaration of war to Earth. Earth sent its own declaration on June 1st, 2156, and the Romulan Earth War had begun. The Romulans wasted no time and seized the initiative, enacting the Dorithal Plan, with two fleets carrying out a pincer movement around Earth, attacking the more remote human colonies. This would have the twin effects of drawing Starfleet away from Earth, leaving it vulnerable, as well as cutting the humans off from their allies. These two fleets struck into human territory from Algeron and Galondon Core, respectively under the command of Admiral Diderdex and Admiral Kassara, each composed of nine ships and supported by significant numbers of fighters. These two fleets were further supported by the now disgraced command of Aldur, who originally had hoped to lead the invasion himself, but was now relegated to the command of the reserve fleet stationed at Gamma Hydra. The initial Romulan advance was devastating, capturing four systems in less than four months. At the time, this was an unprecedented advance, given the relative speeds of the period. However, while the Romulan birds of prey, in particular the dreaded Tavaro class, were superior to their human counterparts, the Romulans owed much of their success to their telecapture units. These allowed the Romulans to remotely seize control of nearly any vessel, and thus turn it against its allies. This did much in the early phases of the war to limit Romulan losses as well as sow distrust behind enemy lines. De Duridex and Kassara both captured the outlying human colonies of Calda and Tarod. However, Kassara, emboldened by his initial success, hastily advanced further into human space, capturing the major colony of Deneva and the science outpost of Berengaria, cutting Earth off from its Vulcan and Andorian allies. However, in doing so, Kassara made himself vulnerable, outrunning much of his fleet, which was unable to keep pace with Kassara, requiring resupply and repairs. Thus, by the time he reached Berengaria, he had stretched his supply to the limit. Meanwhile, De Duradex adopted a more cautious approach, moving his fleet at a slower speed and keeping cohesion. However, this meant he had still yet to reach Tau Ceti, allowing the humans time to regroup and reorganize. Admiral Archer, a veteran of deep space, wished to seize the initiative in a counter-attack. However, he was overruled by the more cautious Admiral Black, who pushed for a more defensive stance around Earth. However, after a Romulan attack was repelled in the Altair system, Starfleet became more confident, realizing that Kassara had overreached himself, revealing himself to be vulnerable. With De Duradex still presumed light years away, a task force was assembled under the command of Admiral Archer, consisting of 14 ships led by the Enterprise NX-01, supported by the Intrepid, however most of the fleet consisted of Daedalus-class cruisers. The Daedalus-class, with a length of 120 meters, a width of 48 meters, and a draft of 40 meters, was the mainstay of human forces during the war. While not as up-to-date as vessels such as the NX, Freedom, and Intrepid classes, the Daedalus were both numerous and reliable forming the bulk of Starfleet during the war. It was protected by polarized hull plating and was armed with four laser cannons and two nuclear torpedo tubes. While photonic torpedoes were available, there were not enough to be issued fleet-wide, and so Starfleet chose to simplify logistics by equipping all ships with the Mark V nuclear torpedo. While lacking the yield of a photonic torpedo, it had a similar range and improved accuracy, 
particularly when compared to the Romulan fusion torpedo. The Daedalus was crewed by 200 personnel and had a capacity of up to four auxiliary craft, either shuttle pods or fighters, allowing for the transport of up to 24 Makos in a single wave. Starfleet interpreted the failed attack on Altair as a sign of weakness and estimated there only to be a handful of ships at Berengaria. However, they were mistaken. In the time it took Starfleet to gather their fleet, most of Kassara's ships caught up, allowing Kassara to prepare a set of last-minute defences, setting up a warp detection grid and planning a trap for Archer. Kassara's fleet was smaller, consisting of only eight ships. However, he was confident in their superiority. The fleet was made up of two Tavaro birds of prey, two U-25 Tyrannus, four U-28 Sparrow attack ships. The Tyrannus, otherwise known as the Clavicle, was the mainline Romulan heavy cruiser during the war. With a length of 150 meters, a wingspan of 107 meters, and a draft of 40 meters, it was armed with a heavy plasma cannon, and had a vast supply of over 100 fusion missiles, with at least 50 long-range missiles and 30 short-range missiles. While powerful, it proved slow and cumbersome, and was only seen in defensive engagements. The U-28 Sparrows were among the older designs of the Romulans, placing an emphasis on speed and agility. The Sparrow was extremely small, with a length of 65 meters, a width of 61 meters, and a draft of 14 meters. It was armed with two light plasma cannons and a single missile launcher. They made for indispensable scouts in the early stages of the war. While outnumbered and undersupplied, Kassara was confident that he could hold the system and deployed his ships in a depth defense pattern, deploying the two Tavaro birds of prey along the edge of the system in order to harass the rear of the human fleet. Hidden within the asteroid belt were the Sparrows. Finally, the Tyrannus cruisers held the last line, awaiting behind Berengaria 7's moon. Archer's plan of attack was relatively simple, relying on strength in numbers. Dividing his forces into two columns, led respectively by the Enterprise and Intrepid, to enter the system at impulse in order to avoid the warp detection grid. Upon making contact with the enemy, one of the columns would engage in the form of an echelon, whilst the other moves to surround the enemy fleet and outflank them. Archer believed that the key to an effective attack was simplicity and adaptability. Archer's fleet arrived at the Berengaria system on the 2nd of April 2156, cautiously entering the system at impulse power. This surprised Kassara, who expected Archer to come out of warp much closer to the planet. However, Kassara, with its flagship out of position, protected only by his sensor screen, was unable to give new orders to his fleet, now out of position. Squadron Commander Vorodos, in a reckless show of bravado, led his Sparrow Squadron out of the asteroid belt, attacking without any support or cover. As Archer engages, drawing his column into line, Ramirez is left vulnerable, and Kassara begins harassing the rear of Ramirez's column. Archer and Vorodus launched a salvo of missiles at one another. However, the Romulans soon realize they are outgunned, and Kassara orders his two cruisers to move to new positions and near the asteroid belt. Ramirez ordered his ships into a diamond formation to protect his flanks, forcing Kassara to disengage, however not before inflicting severe damage on the Olympus and Valley Forge. Vorodus was forced to retreat after one sparrow was destroyed and another heavily damaged. However, Archer did not emerge unscathed, with several ships taking damage, and the USS Zephram Cochrane on the starboard flank came under attack from the other Tavaro and was destroyed. Archer and Ramirez were forced to halt and regroup, 
allowing Kassara time to fall back to the asteroid belt and prepare fresh defences. Archer and Ramirez advanced in a twin echelon formation, forming a V shape, the two supporting each other. However, as they moved through the asteroid belt, their formation began to lose cohesion and the ships became isolated. Then Kassara struck, attacking the Enterprise with his two Tavaros, falling for Archer's bait. As they lowered their sensor screens to attack, they were greeted by the combined fire of both groups who closed ranks as the Tavaros appeared. Kassara managed to escape, however, suffered heavy damage to her communication ray. However, his sister ship was destroyed. However, Voridus took this opportunity, outflanking the human fleet and finishing off the Olympus and Valley Forge. However, rather than withdraw, Voridus pressed his advantage, and while he succeeded in destroying the Dextra, his squadron was surrounded and destroyed by Archer, who was quicker to respond than anticipated. However, as Kassara retreated, he left a trail of warheads with proximity fuses. Another human ship, the Probert, was caught in the detonation and destroyed, with several others taking heavy damage from the debris, forcing Archer out of the cover of the asteroid belt and into the sights of the two Tyrannus cruisers, which unleashed a potent volley, destroying the Ptolemy and Stephen Decatur, and heavily damaging several others. However, rather than risking his cruisers, Commander Amelius followed Kassara in his retreat, and so the Battle of Berengaria was over, and Earth had won her first major victory, but at a great cost, losing seven Daedalus cruisers in the battle. Nevertheless, Archer had won a resounding victory, not only stopping, but driving back the seemingly inexorable Romulan advance, allowing humanity a new sense of optimism in the war which until then looked to end with Earth under the wings of Romulus. The liberation of Berengaria would also open the lines of supply to Vulcan. After the battle, Archer is quoted as saying, Our enemy has tried and failed to isolate us, to sever those bonds of friendship which make us strong. We stand not as individuals, but together. Together we stand, together we fall, but today, we go forward together. Optimistic words going forward as he continued his fight to lift the Alpha Quadrant from the shadow of the Raptor's wings.